thank you for joining us today. We will get started in a few more minutes. Thank you everyone for joining us today. We're gonna to get started in a couple of minutes. Thank you everyone for joining us today. It is 12, so we do like to start promptly. Um, I'm just gonna go over some housekeeping and before I introduce our facilitator for the day. Uh, welcome, I appreciate everyone joining us. Uh, this is a webinar on the remote business analyst and how the role ha may have changed in the past few months. Uh, everyone is muted by default. We are going to allow some time for questions at the end of the presentation. We would ask then that you either type your question into the chat or use the Q&A feature. We will read out all the questions so everyone can hear them clearly at the end of the presentation. Um, this webinar is endorsed by the IIBA. So if you're working towards your ECBA, it does count as PD hours, or if you're trying to complete some uh, com continuing uh, education units towards your IIBA certification, it is one hour. And I would be very happy to introduce Tendai Chakabuda, our facilitator for today. She's one of our newest business analysis instructors. One benefit to this pandemic is that we are now able to expand our instructor pool and get people from different areas of the country. So Tendai is hailing from Toronto. She is a certified business analysis professional uh, with over 12 years of experience in the business analysis domain. She's been exposed to enterprise-wide project and ha which has enabled her to sharpen her business analysis skills and given her very unique insights into how to add value as a business analyst. She's currently practicing as a senior business analyst in Toronto and enjoys sharing business analysis best practices with industry peers. She's been instrumental in leading business analysis communities of practice and has run several successful mentoring programs for aspiring business analysts. She's very passionate about giving back to the business analysis community and enabling BAs to get the, to the next level in their career. And she is a lifelong learner, mentor, and coach. And without further ado, I will pass it off to Tendai Chakabuda. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sydney. What an introduction. Hi, guys. I can't see you all, but I'm really excited to be here to share what I think is, is where our profession as business analysts are, are heading with a new pandemic that's, that's hit us out of nowhere. You know, what does the role of business analysis mean in this time? How is it shaped? How's the pandemic shaping the role of business analysis? I think a lot of us are finding ourselves in really unprecedented unprecedented times. I think remote working has really become the new norm for us as BAs and we need to adjust. 
I think the how, the fundamental work that we do as business analysts remains the same. However, the way in which we conduct our work or the environment in which we conduct our work has significantly changed. One of the key things I feel is that the challenges that we have as business analysts is being able to get maximum value from our stakeholders whilst we are working remotely. Um, please feel free to fire off any questions. As Sydney said, we will get the questions towards the end of the session. I hope you'll find this session very um, useful with a lot of tips. I urge you please take your pen, your notepad and make notes as I go along the presentation. Like Sydney um, introduced me, I am a new course instructor with McEwen School of Continuing Education. I'll be instructing business analysis courses. Um, she gave a big brief background of my um, professional experience. I am currently practicing as a senior business analyst, as a product owner. I'm extremely passionate about business analysis as well as the development of young professional business, and, uh, business analysts um, in, in the profession. Right, going on to um, what I'm going to cover today. I think it's so important that I lay, lay out the fundamental statistics that, that, I, that I came across. This was done specifically by Price Waterhouse Coopers, PwC. It was a Canadian workforce study done in July, 2020 this year. Remote work, guys, it's here to stay. So we need to adjust to this new world of working. I think we need to start reimagining how we're going to be using technology to collaborate, to innovate and deliver frequently. So before, I think they said that 82% of um, employees were working externally going into offices. And now that's down to 27% and almost 59% of people are working remotely. These are powerful statistics. This study was done within Canada over 500 companies. And the fact that almost 60% of employees in general are working remotely, I think it's fundamental that we share tips on how we can be more productive, share tips on how we can be more you know, innovative within our profession. Right, in my presentation, I'm going to cover four main chapters. The first one being, how do you as business analysts plan and manage your work you know, remotely? Secondly, I'm going to share tips on how to conduct requirements gathering and validation remotely. I'm then going to go into tools that you can use as a business analyst to get maximum value from your stakeholders remotely. And then finally, I'm going to go to a, a key area, which is really managing and maintaining stakeholder relationships which is what we must always do as business analysts remotely. Going on to chapter one, which is planning and managing your work as a remote business analyst. I came across this quote from um, Jay Mayer. He's a motivational speaker and productivity is never an accident. It is always the result of a commitment to excellence intelligent planning and focused effort. You know, I think for me, this shows that productivity is a mindset. I think before the pandemic, I used to hear a lot of business analysts and a lot of people saying, you know what, I can only pr be productive in the office. I can only be productive in a coffee shop. I can only be productive in a library. But this has really changed. I think right now, as it stands, we are now restricted and we have to make it work where we are. So here's the thing, guys. Productivity is actually a mindset. Don't limit your productivity because of where you are physically where you are physically. It's all in the mindset. I think everyone works differently. And when it comes to being a remote business analyst, you must get to know what works for you and learn to make yourself accountable for the results that you create. I think the key here is find what works for you. I think motivating ourselves to be productive and creating is especially challenging because you're working alone, you're not around your colleagues and so forth. But I think this is really when we need to deep down, um, dig deep. So one of the first things I feel the first and important factor to consider when planning and managing your work as a remote business analyst is time management. I think a key study has shown that employees who successfully manage the remote work environment are great at time management. This was said by Forbes Human Council, which Forbes Human Resources Council in 2020. I think for us BAs, the day seems you know, it's a never ending day. We've got a lot of meetings, we've got a lot of calls, there's a lot of emails coming, there's a lot of project work. And I think the, the key finding here was that employees that are able to really manage their calendar, really manage urgent, important tasks, uh, employees are really productive and get things done. 
I am really a, a proponent for Stephen Covey, and I don't know if, if you guys have read his book, but Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And one of his habits, which is habit three, is really putting first things first. And this speaks to time management. So putting first things first really means organizing and really executing around your most important priorities. We spend our time as individuals, as business analysts, in one of four ways, depending on the two factors that define an activity, which is urgent and important. Here comes the, the what they call the time quadrant. So quadrant one, you'll see here, is urgent and important. Basically, here you're in firefighting mode, you're always dealing with a lot of crises, there's a lot of deadlines that you're trying to meet. And I feel that sometimes as business analysts, this is, this is really the quadrant we, we were focusing on so much because everything is urgent, we've got a lot of stakeholder commitments that we've done, there's a lot of deadlines that we need to meet. And, you know, most of us are focusing in this Q1 uh, you know, this quadrant environment, which is really not optimal for us as business analysts. We need to make a shift towards being in the second quadrant, which is quadrant two. What quadrant two really like uh, allows us as business analysts is really think, really do a lot of proactive work. I think here this com there comes planning, there comes prevention, you know, improving what you're trying to do with your stakeholders, relationship building, recognizing new opportunities, and really spending time on these activities will really enable us as business analysts to become more proficient in our role and above all deliver effective solutions to business analysts, to our stakeholders. Quadrant three and quadrant four, which are the bottom not important, um, urgent and not urgent tasks. I think a lot of a lot of us do play in these in these specific spaces now more than ever, perhaps with remote working. Um, quadrant three speaks to you know many of us spending a big portion of our time in specific interruptions, ringing phones, emails coming through. You know, just really doing things that really don't add value to what you have to achieve as a business analyst. And then quadrant four is really the, the waste, what they term the, the waste triangle. I think this is where you, you kind of like avoiding what you need to do, which is probably, you know, these times of being remote, you know, there's so many disruptions, there's so many interaction, interruptions at home, you know, so really spending too much time in this quadrant on non-urgent, not important things really can lead to a dependence on others for your basic, for your job, even, you know, you, you're not coming across as responsible. As, as a business analyst. So really the key takeaway from this slide is your time as a business analyst is so important when you're working remotely. You have to actually put focused effort in towards streamlining what you need to do to deliver your specific project commitments. And you really want to spend time in quadrant two, which is all about effectiveness. The second factor to consider when planning and managing your work as a remote business analyst is really, I feel, is consistency. And what do I mean by consistency? You know, every day when we go to work, we show up. We show up. You used to show up every single day when we're physically going to work. And when I look at four things, namely your routine, your availability, meeting etiquette, email etiquette, we as business analysts really need to maintain consistency around these four items. If we start with your routine, I think really you need to plan your remote work like an office day. Like I said, you need to show up and be present just like you would be in person. So really have a dedicated office area space, have specific times that you know you're logging in and logging out so that your stakeholders are also aware when you are available. Your availability as well is very important. Just like stakeholders would see in the office or your team would see in your office, I think it's so important to sign in if you're using any technology like Skype, Microsoft Teams, sign in and really be available on instant messaging. Remember guys, we're no longer in the office. When you're in the office, you could pass someone's desk, you can have a light chit chat, or you could pass someone you know, in the cafeteria or whatever it may be. But right now we don't have that interaction of small chit chat. So really being signing in and being available on instant messaging, I feel is, is very important as a remote business analyst, as well as signing out when you're not available very important because you don't want your stakeholders or your team to be looking for you. You've probably stepped out, you didn't sign out. You don't want them to be looking for you when you, you're actually not available. Going on to meeting etiquette, I think, you know, we are spending the entire day on calls. I think it's very important here that we really brush, brush up our meeting etiquette. The first thing is really be early to meetings. I think, you know, now that we are on Zoom or, or Teams or Skype or whatever it may be, 
there's really no need, you're not walking to a specific, you know, meeting room or so forth. So really be early to meetings. And another thing is allow for three to five minutes for a bio break and dropping off a call and entering a new one. I think this is so important. Like I said, literally eight to five, we are on calls. So always allow that space for individuals to be able to breathe and come into a meeting. Another important one is load materials beforehand and close any unwanted or sensitive views. I think that's, that's also important. I think really you don't want sensitive information to come across your screen. The last one that I put, you'll see, I put it right at the end is really show your face. I think, you know, really with your stakeholders, you want to build your credibility. Don't hide behind a camera, show up, be present, you know, dress appropriately and really be present as, as a remote business analyst. Finally, email etiquette. I think it's so important to, to acknowledge emails when they're received and then indicate when you'll get back to that. Before I would bump it to people in the office and you know, someone will be like, Tendai, I sent you an email. I'll be like, yes, don't worry, I'll get to it, I'll respond. But remember now we're remote, you don't have that opportunity to chat. So when someone does send you an email, if you're not gonna attend to it, I think it's important to acknowledge and tell them when you will be you know, responding to that specific email. The final thing, you know, when planning and managing your work, your work as a remote business analyst is, I think for me, this is so important, is that you really need to maintain two fundamental values, which are integrity and accountability. I think for me, you know, integrity, the true definition of integrity is doing the right thing, even, no one is, even when no one is watching. We are remote. You're not around your team. You're not in an open office and so forth. So for me, integrity, I think to truly succeed in a remote working environment, an employee needs to have integrity and as well as motivation. For me, that's absolutely critical. Another value that I feel is critical is really accountability. Remote employees need to have deeply ingrained personal accountability. As business analysts, guys, you know, we, we are, we've got so much on our plate. We've got a lot of deliverables. We've got a lot of deadlines. I think it's so important that we, we remain accountable to what we've committed to ourselves. You hold yourself accountable to, to a very high standard and you know, you're reliable. You want to be seen as reliable. You want to be seen as delivering so that your stakeholders can trust you well enough to come to you when they've got business problems. So integrity, accountability, I feel that even goes beyond being a remote business analyst. That's just you being true to yourself as a person. So in, in conclusion with this specific chapter, I think planning and managing your work as a remote business analyst. Time management, like I said, you want to spend yourself, you want to spend your time in quadrant two, which is prevention, planning, improvement, continuous improvement. You want to maintain consistency as a business analyst. Like I said, consistency with your routine, with your availability, with your meeting etiquette, as well as your email etiquette. And finally, maintain your values, integrity, and accountability. So those are the key three things that I feel are important when planning and managing your work as a remote business analyst. I'm going to move on to the second chapter which, where I'm talking about you know, gathering requirements as a remote business analyst and even validating those requirements. I think everyone on the call is probably aware that there's a huge cost involved with requirements that are misunderstood. One of the top reasons why projects fail is poorly defined requirements. Requirements don't represent the actual needs of, of a customer, or maybe requirements are incomplete, they're conflicting, they're not consistent. So requirements gathering, I feel, is really a crucial part of any project, whether it be large, whether it be so, this very small. I think it's essential to understanding and fulfilling the needs of, of our customers. And I love this diagram. I always show it to, to a lot of my, my mentees. Um, you know, when requirements are mis misunderstood, this just shows you where, you know, what the customer wanted from the start <laughs> to what was billed and to, I love the consultant, <laughs> the consultant, how the consultant filled that and, you know, what eventually the customer received. I think already, you guys, as it is, face-to-face -face communication has its own challenges. You know, now add in that virtual layer of requirements gathering, requirements elic elicitation, requirements validation. It's challenging. And I think us as business analysts really need to be very creative when, when operating um, virtually. I always say the key thing for business analysts is to bring clarity. Clarity to requirements, clarity to the solution, clarity in making all stakeholders come on the same page. So really, how is this done in a virtual environment already, as it is in person, that was challenging. There were quite a lot of nuances. So, you know, I'm just going to give you a few tips in terms of how you can really bring that clarity, how you can really do that remotely. This is my favorite, guys. I think 
pictures tell a thousand words. You don't want to go into a call, bring up your <laughs> 50 page BRS document or you know words on the screen you, you're going to lose people I think it's so important for you to really bring out you know pictures pictures tell a thousand words and you know as, as a business analyst I love our toolkit we've got so many tools that we can use as business analysts I think I've only put it up six here but there's fast there's, there's quite a lot you know process flow diagrams context diagrams storyboards customer journey mapping functional decomposition mind maps there's so many tools that we can use as a business analyst in order to get those requirements that we need for, for uh, from our stakeholders. And I think the advantages of using these pictures is that they really grab the attention of your stakeholders. It builds interest, right? And it also enhances the discussions amongst your stakeholders. And I think in general, what these visual aids do is they really bring greater clarity about topics being discussed, as well as just making sure that your stakeholders are on the on the same on the same page. So the fact that we've got so many tools in our toolbox, I always imagine a business analyst as a doctor holding their toolbox, you know, you've got so many tools. As a business analyst, you need to know which tools are going to work for you when it comes to, you know, listing requirements, validating requirements for your stakeholders, especially within the remote environment. And try and bring those tools that you know that have got a really big visual element to them. For example, you don't want to bring something like a use case narrative because you know that's quite a lot of words. Rather put that in a, you know, in a diagram and see how your stakeholders will receive that. So here I've just put a few tips in terms of you know, what using visual aids, a few tips for, for business analysts. I think the first and important thing is choose those visual aids that are relevant and appropriate. I, I, I always, you know, whenever you, you meet business analysts, they're so proud of their documents, but, you know, for one requirement, they've used quite a lot of, a lot of, um, what is it, a lot of tools, you know, and tools techniques. You don't have to illustrate the fact that you know them to use a lot of tools. You just need to use one diagram or one representation that will adequately represent the requirement that you're trying to convey to your stakeholders. Another thing is maintain consistency, you know, with your stakeholders, understand your stakeholders, know what works, know what doesn't work and give them those specific, you know, tools, techniques, whatever you're using that you know they'll be able to identify, that you know they'll be able to speak to as well. Ensure visibility. Now that we're working remotely, you know, you're sharing your screen, a lot of people, that's too small, I can't see, your screen is not loading and so forth. So, you know, all of those things, just make sure that the visibility of whatever you're trying to, to present to your stakeholders, you know, is very present and people can see that. And last, of all, last but not least, um, don't overwhelm your stakeholders. You know, we understand the tools, we understand the specific items that we're using, but always put yourself in your stakeholders' shoes and say that if I was to show this to someone who's not a business analyst, how will they receive it? How would it look like? Moving on to tips on conducting effective requirements gathering virtually. So I re really here, I've just put down points that I've seen over the past few months working remotely. I think one, one famous one is, you know, try and use round robin to avoid talking over one another. You're not in one room anymore. You, you're on, you, you, you on, you know, Zoom or Skype or whatever it may be, and people don't see each other. And also you may be sharing your screen. You're not able to see, you know, your participants. So really try and use the round robin technique to avoid your stakeholders talking over one another. And I also think it's important at the beginning of the call, take a roll call, you know, ask people to introduce themselves, what they mean to the project and so forth. That's very important. So we, because again, some people won't be able, if you're sharing your screen, you won't be able to see all participants. You know, I think a third one for me is very important. What time are you scheduling your calls? Uh, for me, I think, you know, first thing in the morning, I like to engage people first thing in the morning, which some people don't like, but I feel like people are, you know, people are still giving, will give you that insight that you require. There's a lot of Zoom fatigue. There's a lot of Microsoft Teams fatigue. And if you're going to schedule your requirements gathering session, maybe at four o'clock or five o'clock, it's too late. And maybe you're going to lose quite a lot of people. So I would always encourage to do it, you know, in the morning. Give stakeholders enough context and enough time if preparation is needed. I can't overemphasize this. This is very important. Prior to the meeting, you know, even when you send out the meeting invite, ensure that your stakeholders understand what will be required from them. If there's any preparation materials that you need to send beforehand, send those as well. This goes into the next point, which is the agenda. Make sure that you lay out the agenda well in advance. Set rules. Like I said, 
camera on and make sure that you know you can see your stakeholders you understand you can see who's there and then also make use of a virtual parking board later on in my presentation i'm going to go to some tools that you can use as a remote business analyst so rounding off this chapter, which is really around requirements gathering and validation as a remote business analyst. I've given you a few tips, you know, specifically pictures telling a thousand words, tips on visual aids, and really how you can conduct effective virtual requirements gathering um, meetings. I think this is these are the three key, three key takeaways from this specific chapter. Moving on to chapter three, which is collaboration tools you can use to get maximum value from stakeholders remotely. Right, I really love this quote, which is, it is not the strongest or the most intelligent who will survive, but those who can best manage change. So really this quote for me speaks to flexibility, agility. You know, as BAs, we need to be flexible and agile enough, especially in these times. We need to diversify our toolbox. I know we've got a lot of trusted ways of doing things, but in this new pandemic, with this new remote work that we're finding ourselves, I think it's so important to step out of our comfort zones. You know, adaptability, um, LinkedIn learning really does, um, you know, top skills for each year. And for 2020, one of the top, top soft skills for LinkedIn learning was adaptability. And for us as business analysts, I think that is so important. Okay, so what qualities are required to adapt to embrace new tools? I think very important is continuous improvement mindset. You know, what do I mean by a continuous improvement mindset? We are going to experience many unknowns. Everyone, for a lot of professionals working remotely, but I think it's important to realize that these unknowns, these new situations present opportunities for you as an individual to grow. Mistakes, you know, will happen, but looking back on that mistake and saying, how do I improve? I think is an important quality for any individual to have. Another thing is lifelong learning growth mindset is so important seeing things and realizing that you know what i'll get today in one i'll get there one stage you know actively seeking opportunities to grow very important and last but not least adaptability being open to new ideas being open to change and adjusting as and when is needed i think it's important here i've just listed uh, you know collaboration tools that i found that have worked over the past few months that we've been, you know, as a business analyst that I've been working remotely. Mentimeter is one of the most popular ones that's being used. I really enjoy using this tool because you really get to get your stakeholders thoughts and it really represents it in a very nice way, visual way. Um, this is great for interactive presentations as well as meetings. There's also Miro, which is really a virtual whiteboard. And these are free guys, these are free tools that you can, you know, try, try out by yourself and really go into sessions with, with your stakeholders to, to really show them this. Fun retro, easy retro, really a great way for those of you who are agile, for sprint retrospectives as well as virtual meetings. Even if you're not agile, I think it's actually a great tool as well, even if you're still doing traditional waterfall to get ideas from your stakeholders because you're able to categorize specific sections on the fun retro board and get feedback from your stakeholders. Asana is also a great team collaboration tool. It's used to track you know, status of projects, tracking of specific activities. And then Envision app, which is really for prototyping and digital whiteboards. I think for me, these are the kind of tools that I've come across. There are many more tools out there and I would encourage you to do your research, really take a screenshot of this and really go and explore to see what these tools are all about. Moving on to chapter four, which is managing and maintaining stakeholder relationships remotely. I really like this, this quote, which is stakeholder engagement is a never ending process. We have to continually earn stakeholders confidence. It's a relationship. You know, as business analysts, we are responsible for identifying organizational problems, elicitation, documentation, you know, managing stakeholder requirements. We recommend solutions. We facilitate, you know, successful implementation of these solutions. But in order to do all of that, you must have good relationships with a number of stakeholders throughout the, the organizations. So stakeholder engagement is incredibly important to successful business and to successful business analysis. I think without engaged stakeholders who care about the project or what you're trying to deliver, you'll actually end up working quite harder to discover the right requirements. As business analysts, I think we need to really continuously foster these stakeholder relationships. 
we need to help facilitate solutions for these stakeholders and ultimately deliver any solutions that they want. So prior to the pandemic, like I said, we could walk over to someone's desk or have an informal chit chat. So now how do we as business analysts really manage and maintain these stakeholders relationships remotely? A few tips. So I think you've, many of you would have heard, you know, that business analysts were striving to become more of trusted advisors. What does that mean? A trusted advisor meaning that if a stakeholder has a problem, if they think they've got a problem within the department or who knows, within the organization, you want to be the person that that stakeholder calls. As a business analyst, because you want to be known as a problem solver, you want to be known as a value creator, you want that stakeholder to pick up the phone and to call you. How do you do this when you're remote, when you know, you're out of sight? This is when you need to be really proactive in managing these stakeholder relationships. So in terms of communication, you need to be very clear. You need to be very concise with the way you can communicate with the stakeholders. You need to follow up on emails. And you know what, if you're unable to put an email really speak to someone if you're seeing that you're struggling to put words in an email or you, you won't come across right, really schedule some time with your stakeholders and, and chat to them. Be proactive. What do I mean by be proactive? You know, the, the old saying of out of sight, of, out of mind. I think that's so true. You know, you're going to meetings and people are like, tonight we haven't seen you for eight, nine months. And these are, these are key stakeholders, you know. So from my experience, what I've done is I've scheduled regular touch points, maybe bi-weekly or monthly. I go in there, even if I don't, even if they're not on my project or I don't have a specific, you know, need from them, I still meet with them to ask them. Hi, how, what, what's going on in your department? How are things going? You know, you don't want to be out of sight that they forget you. You want to be there. You want to be that value creator, that problem solver, that trusted advisor. So really, if you can schedule updates with them or meetings, it's literally a virtual, I call them virtual coffees. 15 minutes is all you need once a month. Chat to them and just hear what's going on in their organization, you know, in their specific department. And then give updates on projects. Ask if there's any new initiatives within that specific department. And finally, key decisions. If you know that you've got key decisions that need to be made for your specific project or whatever you're working on, I think it's so important to give them adequate time to prepare, you know, sensitize them well in advance and give them all the necessary information that is required for them to, to make that specific decision. So in general, I think stakeholders have a vested interest in the change, the need or the solution that's being proposed and their key part. So it's up to us as business analysts to make sure that we continue continuously fostering and nurturing that specific relationship with our stakeholders. To conclude guys, I think I've gone through specific four chapters that speak to how you can become more of an effective remote business analyst. I started with planning and managing your work as a remote business analyst. And I spoke about three things here. I spoke about time management, maintaining consistency and values. Time management, like I said, you want to play in that quadrant two where you're doing proactive planning. Consistency, I spoke about your routine, your availability, your meeting etiquette and your email etiquette. Then I spoke about the values of integrity and accountability. The second chapter that we went into was understanding how to conduct requirements gathering remotely. There I said, pictures tell a thousand words, really use a lot of visual aids. And I also gave you tips on how to conduct requirements virtually. Then chapter three, we then looked into specific tools you could use to get maximum value from stakeholders remotely. There, be open, be flexible to new ways of doing things as a business analyst. I think it's the key takeaway from that. And finally, managing and maintaining stakeholder relationships remotely, really wanting to become that trusted advisor with effective communication, proactiveness with your stakeholders. I hope the tips that I've shared with you in this webinar, you'll be able to go back. And I always say, you know, even if you, you just got one, I think for me, that's a key win. You know, just going back into your environment, your specific environment, and really trying to action that and enable that. And please do keep in touch. I will be having my next course starting end of January, which is around requirements analysis and de design definition. If you're interested, I've put in the link. It happens weekends and it's online. So wherever you are in the world, you are free to join. Thank you so much, Sydney. I don't know if you've got any questions. Thank you, Tendai. That was wonderful. Lots of very good information. I would say that it's applicable to a lot of us, not just business analysts. So I appreciate that. A lot of takeaways, I think. Um, we do have three questions in the chat so far, but they're all the same. People are asking if they could get a copy of your presentation. Sure. 
Sure. Okay. So the uh, this session is recorded. I apologize. I should have mentioned that at the start of the session. So it has been recorded and we will be sending out a link to the recording after this session. And we can also include a copy of the slide deck. Are there any other questions? If you do have questions, there's a Q&A option and also the chat as well. Uh, the question about the PDUs. Yes, it is. It does count as a PDU. It is an IIBA uh, endorsed webinar. Mm -hmm. uh, here's a question from Bertina. What tips do you have managing conflict virtually? <laughs> Great question, Bertina. You know, I think managing conflict communication, regardless of what, don't do it via chat, don't do it via email, phone the person and really speak to them. I think, you know, you want to remove the virtual element. So definitely communication, managing conflicts, even if you're not virtually, I think it's key. I think it's a key tool. Uh, we have a question here from a CPA who um, has wanted to become a business analyst. Any suggestions for any technical skills that they should uh, obtain in order to become a BA? Someone. Yeah, I think, you know, being a CPA, that's a ch chartered professional accountant, I'm, I'm sure, Helen. I think, Helen, what's important is that what I love about business an analysis, actually, is that a lot of people stumble on the profession. So what you need to do is, you, I always say, go and read job descriptions for business analysis, first of all, and then look back on your career and see what specific skills. You'll be amazed to see that some of the skills, some of the things you used to do as a CPA, as a CPA would actually, you know, come into being a business analyst. So really, as a first, as a first um, stab at that, I think that will be great for you. Um, in terms of technical skills, there are so many professions, even here at McEwen School of Continuing Education, there's a lot of courses that we offer. I think there's a generic, you know, introduction to business analysis where you can come and just have an overview of what the business analysis profession is all about. So I'd encourage you to, to look into that. Uh, another question from Charity. You mentioned being seen. She's asking, is it really necessary to have your video on at all times? You know what? I, I, I believe in having the video on at all times, especially with your stakeholders. You know, it, just, it, it builds credibility, you know, the, and it shows, like I said, be present. Don't um, hide behind a camera. Don't, you know, really be present with your stakeholders. Be seen, be heard, you know, be, th be that front line that you want for your, for, as a business analyst. I think you, you'll be doing justice to yourself as well as to the profession overall. Thank you. A uh, question from Cecilia. What tips do you have in getting the tech leads to start conversing to devise a solution once you've specified the requirements? Yeah. A challenging question. Yeah. yeah, that's such a challenging question because, you know, tech leads, I hope you don't have a tech lead on the call. <laughs> I think tech leads is, is always that whole thing is they want you to hand, hand over your requirement specification over to them. But, you know, I think what works is really, first of all, orientating them to whatever problem or solution that you're trying to, to bring to the plate. Bring these guys right, right to the front. You know, this is what I love as well. I'm, I'm currently practicing in an agile team, but as agile teams, whether you're a tech lead or so forth, you also speak to stakeholders, you know, versus being in a waterfall where you just pass over the requirement specification. So really your tech leads, bring them up. I mean, if, if because they not only there to develop, they're also solving the business problem with you as well. So bring them up in conversations. You know, if they they're probably shy, I know they really, you know they want to be in front of a computer and so forth. But really try and market to them so that they come up, bring them up in the conversations with your stakeholders. I think that will really get a bit of buy-in from their side. Thank you. Um, how difficult is it now for a remote BA to get new requirements elicitation if the requirements elicitation is done previously or was done physically? So it was previously done on site mm. in a warehouse or a manufacturing plant. How do you do that mm -hmm. remotely? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it depends what tools you're using, Samuel. I think if you are on Teams or so forth, this is where you have to make sure that you're using the tools that are appropriate. I did share, you know, process flow diagrams and all of those kind of things. Try and do, I think, prior to going into that requirement session, try and use other methods. So, for example, document analysis, 
go there and see what is already there and try and come up with you know high level requirements based on what you've seen and bring this to the party especially if you're going to be in a virtual environment and hopefully that can start the discussion and initiate this discussion going forward Thank you. Uh, question from Dimple. How can we change the culture of an organization if they are not happy to change with using new tools? Stakeholders are often not familiar with the new tools. Yeah, you know what? This is the thing. As business analysts, we are change agents. I always say we are change agents. So you, as a business analyst, need to really stand there and market it, market the specific tool that you bring to the organization, market the value, show them how this can really either enhance or transform the actual solution that you want to bring to the party. So you have to believe in what you're doing in order to get other people to believe into it. So really, if I see that you believe in it, I as a stakeholder perhaps will you know, actually start taking care of it and actually start being of interest in it. So really, you believe in it and then you can sell it to other people. Great, thank you. A uh, question from Marion. What collaboration tools would you recommend for using in a high security environment? So Miro looks perfect for brainstorming sessions, but sessions mm -hmm. with stakeholders, but they can't use it because data is saved elsewhere in the cloud. That's, that's correct. I think there's, there's a lot of conversations to be had with your security team, because I think also in my organization, they also, we had to also, there's, there's a thin line because you don't want organization data to be stored on, you know, external tools. So the ones that I've shared with you are free tools, but perhaps as an organization, perhaps as if you've got a center of excellence for business analysts, go out there to, to, your, to your stakeholders or to your security team and tell them we want a tool to conduct requirements gathering virtually and get them to actually purchase a tool if they don't want to use these free cloud-based, you know, tools. I think that could definitely work. Great, thank you. Uh, another question from Charity. What are your thoughts on having coffee or tea when video chatting with stakeholders? Perfect, you know, you know that's, remember I told you that I do virtual coffees, virtual teas. Um, for instance, I think last week I went into a virtual coffee, virtual tea. I, I didn't have my mug and the stakeholder was like, but tonight this is a virtual coffee, this is a virtual tea, where's your mug, you know? So I think that's important but also understanding the context. If you're going into a requirements, formal requirements gathering session with a lot of stakeholders, I mean, you know, don't eat, don't drink, but if you know it's a virtual coffee, by all means do it, do it. You know, it will also just relax the environment as well. Thank you. Uh, there's a comment here, not really a question, but uh, someone mentioned that they found that working remotely has increased written communication that can also be used for documentation. Mm, that, that, that is true, that is very true. Um, I think as a stake, as a business analyst, you still have the responsibility of making sure that all of that communication is stored in a central environment. So even if there's a lot of written communication, if you find something that, that's there of value, upload it to your SharePoint folder or whatever folder that you guys are using within your organization to make sure that it becomes, you know, explicit knowledge, not only for the BA team, but for whoever needs to use it as well. Thank you. Uh, question from Choma, which tools do you recommend BAs learn and use, especially when working remotely? Are there any that are top of your list? Yeah, yeah guys, I tell you all the time, I just, I whip out Visio. I think people say Tendai is to Visio as Visio is to Tendai. For me, Microsoft Visio, if I go into a specific session, I go there, I present, for me, really brush up on your visual school skills because you can use that for mind mapping, for process flow diagram. There's a lot of templates within Visio you could use. So really brush up on your Microsoft visual, uh, visual skills. Whenever you go into a specific session or a specific meeting, you'll be able to really bring out Visio and do whatever is necessary. Thank you. And uh, Irina is saying, first of all, thank you for this uh, presentation. Tenda, do you use special change management tools? Any special mm. tools for vis visualization? Um, Irina, change management, <laughs> I think that's, we've got a specific dedicated change management um, team within, the within our environment, so I don't have any specific knowledge around change management tools, but um, I think for me the tools like I specified for business analysis are the ones that I'll use. Great, thank you. Are there any other questions? One question from Gregory. Uh, in my organization, there's no, no formal documentation done. Development is being done on demand with only technical mm. documentation. Mm. Uh, he would like to introduce a process management mm. framework. How would you mm. try to do that? He's a functional analyst in an IT team. Mm. Any suggestions? Um, is it an old, it's yeah. an old fashioned company. So this is not uncommon, a big learning curve. 
Wow, Gregory, I'm actually surprised that developers develop without documentation. <laughs> that is so interesting. You know, for me, I think, you know, you'll be doing that, your organization justice, if you develop this process management framework, I think it's so important that we have a history, a record of why we did certain things within the organization. And really, I think for you, taking that first initial step, like I said, do a business case. You know, as business analysts, we do business case for projects do a business case for yourself to, you know, motivating the need for formal documentation. That's my advice to you. Once you do that business case, put it in a summary in a presentation and go and present, go and do research in terms of what are the advantages of doing this in a formal way? What are the advantages of having this document, you know, documented and so forth and really sell it to your stakeholders. Guys, I think one key learning for me is if you believe in what you're doing and what you're saying, you can sell it and the other person can buy it. And, you know, they, always, they also say business analysts, we salespeople. So really brush up on your, your sales, <laughs> sales skills as well. You'll be able to sell that to, you, to, to your stakeholders. Perfect. Thank you. And there's a couple more questions coming in. Uh, how do you keep your stakeholders engaged? You know what? I think before you even start a session, don't just jump into the session. You know, ask, guys, how are you doing? You know, they're also humans. We're in, we're in a pandemic. You know, start off the conversation, break the ice. How's it going? How are the kids? You know, if you've got that kind of rapport, because we are, all, we are only human, you know, so really try and break the ice before you start. And then, you know, during the conversation, during the, the requirements gathering session, what it may be, really always do a check in. Guys, are you still there? Do you got, does anyone need a bio break? So, really, those kind of things that you can do during the meeting, I think they could help you keep your stakeholders engaged. Perfect. And a question from Olga, what's the best approach to keep the system settings of an application for different customers up to date? I'll need to know what system settings, she, what does she mean by system settings? I hope she'll be able to say Olga, that. if you could clarify. System values. System values, what is the best approach to keep system values of the application for different customers up to date? how the application works for different customers. I'm struggling to understand the question. <laughs> and so Olga, is it sort of like one product and you customize it for different clients? Is that yeah. sort of asking about how do you keep it up to date for different individuals or different clients? Uh, whether a module should be enabled or not. Or not. Okay, I see. So I'm, I'm assuming these are, this is probably an ERP kind of like system setup and you've got different whether buttons should be visible or not. And you've probably got different subscribers or, okay, great. And you've got different customers. Yeah, I think, you know, with an ERP system, it's, it's, it's very difficult because you don't want to over customize it for specific subscribers. I know that's that's one of the, the pain points that um, we have as business analysts. You don't want to over customize a specific solution for different subscribers. So like I said, you need to try and explain the benefits of, of whatever is currently there on the system. Try and explain to the, the, the subscriber or the, the client or the customers to show them that by doing this, this is the ripple effect or you, know, you can use this, but in this way. So I think just try and sell it to them in a way that the existing um, functionality that is there, how can it cater for their needs? If it doesn't cater for the needs, um, what are the ripple effects if you were to change it on the system? Hope that answers your question. <laughs> You're welcome. Another question. What do you think of Teams planning sessions with 100 people? Is there a way to conduct such sessions in a more effective way? Wow. Oh my gosh. You know what? If you, if you think about it in real life, you'll never have a requirements gathering session with 100 people. That's already way too much. You know, as a business analyst, before you even go into a requirements gathering session, you must do your stake and stakeholder analysis. Who's got influence? Who's got power? If you guys know those stakeholder analysis diagrams, do that stakeholder analysis diagram and narrow it down to just the people that you need in that specific team session. If it's a planning session with 100 people, I think whoever's um, coordinating it will, will really struggle unless you're going to Zoom and then you go into specific breakout rooms. But I think that's, that's, that's a bit too many people. <laughs> you will struggle to, to manage that. You will struggle, break it down. Uh, 
Okay, I think that's about it. I'll give it another few seconds, but lots of great questions. Thank you very much, everyone, for those wonderful questions. And thank you, Tendai. Um, someone, one, oh, the comment here from Amber, great presentation. As someone new to the BA world, I haven't heard of some of the collaboration tools in your presentation, and I'm excited to check them out. Fantastic, fantastic. Thanks, Amber. Thanks for joining us. Okay. And I think it, it sounds like that's about it. So thank you everyone again for attending today. Um, as we said, this will be sent out either later today or tomorrow with a link to the recording and the slide deck. Uh, we really wanna thank Tendai Chakabuda for such a wonderful presentation and sharing all this knowledge with us. I think there's a lot of lessons that we have learned and a lot of things that we can try out, but hopefully everyone's a little bit more confident in that now. So thank you everyone and thank you Tendai. Thank you guys.